WhatsApp and you can be able to take the link that is on Zoom and uh, share it to other people, please do so. And those that are on Facebook, please take that same link and also pass it on <clears throat> to others so that they too can also be able to benefit out of actually what we are passing on uh, during these specific lunch hours. Let us pray as we begin. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to minister your word. I am asking you, Lord, to open up the heavens and cause there to be a starring uh, of the move of God, even as the word will be spoken this wonderful afternoon. I thank you for unbroken utterance. I thank you for the flow of revelation. And I thank you for impartation, even as your word will proceed this afternoon. So I ask that God, you would use me. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, that there will be such a manifestation of your grace and your glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Praise God. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Now, we have been looking at advancing the kingdom of God from last week. We are building on the same note in progression. Uh, from last week, we have been looking at the introduction of what the kingdom of God is. Uh, we went ahead and were able to also look at the importance of what the kingdom, I mean, why the kingdom has to be emphasized in our current times. And also we progressed to look at the dispensations we are living in. We talked about living in the dispensation of grace and the kingdom and i was also able to explain to us the purpose behind grace grace being the enabling power of god that helps us to live the god life and secondly it is also the power of god that helps us to work the works of god it is god's gift given to us to help us live the god life and also god's gift given to us to enable us to also work the works of god we proceeded to understand that if therefore we are to work the works of god and to generate the god life then there must be a reason and the key focus is more so the kingdom of god and this is the key dispensation that we need to focus on and we need to emphasize on this when jesus came even his own predecessor earlier on john the baptist when he was on earth he kept on saying the kingdom of god is at hand repent for the kingdom of god is at hand when jesus picked up and began his ministry he began on the same note when jesus passed it on to the disciples he sent them telling them go and preach the kingdom of god by the time he was leaving them, he made it very clear to them in Luke 24 and verses number 14 that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the ends of the earth and therefore the end will come. So there is a major emphasis of God's kingdom in our current times and we need to keep on hitting this over and over and over. Let me emphasize something here and help us to also understand something that I've been speaking that one of the deceptions the enemy has continually made strong amongst the believers is to bring us into a place of continually believing uh, that what we need more so is the doctrines that revolve around problems, the doctrines that revolve around promise, and which is also very important. It's important to minister to people as relates to the challenges they are facing. It's important to minister to people as it relates to giving them hope and letting them know that there is a better and a brighter future, particularly in the season we are in, uh, when there's a lot of uh, uh, mental challenges, a lot of uh, uh, battles that people are actually facing, uh, economical battles and stuff like that. So it's essential that people can be able to know that God is still at work. It's essential people can also be able to have expectation of miracles. It's essential that people should also be able to witness uh, the power of God to help them come out of their problems. That's very important. But I want you to understand that that is one of the things that the enemy has continually utilized to put the church under siege and to deny it growth to its original posture in life. God's original intent was that the believers should be able to manifest his kingdom. That's why Paul calls us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, he indicates to us that we have a ministry called the ministry of reconciliation that God has given to us, verse number 18. And in verse number 19 of 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 19, Paul again reminds us that we are ambassadors. An ambassador is an extension of, I mean, is an extension of a kingdom. He is an expression of a nation. He is sent by another nation to go and to be able to find a way to partner with the nation in which he's actually planted in. But he doesn't live according to uh, the economics or the realities of the nation he's actually planted in. He lives in his own economy. 
which he's been sent from. He lives in his own realities and also their own ideologies. But one of the key things that you have to understand, the predominant embassy is what influences everything concerning where they are. And by the way, people set up embassies in different places and send, amb send ambassadors in different uh, places with interests, with interests. For example, a nation like Kenya today uh, in East Africa is very important and strategic for particular major nations like America. So when you look at the ambassador of Kenya and you would get to realize that the embassy of Kenya is very critical, just some years ago, back in the year 19, uh, was it 98 or 97, when there was a major bomb blast that went around and they bomb blasted the embassy, the American embassy back in Kenya. The, 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 the people who are known as Al-Shabaab were trying to make a statement. And the statement they were trying to make was, uh, was I think it was Al-Qaeda. They, they were trying to make a statement uh, because they wanted to somewhat destroy something. But they knew that the American embassy strategic being positioned in Kenya, it affects the East African bloc. And, and so that's one of the key reasons why uh, the American nation and also certain other nations would have a major interest as it relates to Kenya. And they would always want to make sure certain things are also influenced in a certain direction. Wh why I'm saying this is to help us to understand that if God permits us to be ambassadors on earth, then we must understand that even the churches are known as embassies. The believers live in what we call embassies. In other words, God has an interest concerning the earth, the earth realm. So if you read scriptures like Psalms 115, please stay with me, Psalms 115 and verse number 16. Verse 16, the Bible says the earth, I mean the heavens, even the heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So that is to say that for God to have any rulership, influence, or to actually allow his purposes to prevail on earth, he requires people that should give him an invite. And these are the believers. So we proceeded to look at scriptures like Revelations 11 and verse number 15. Just stay with me. I'm taking a sample somewhere. Revelations 11 and verse 15, where the Bible tells us that the kingdoms of this world have now become the, have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. So there's an interest that God has. God has an interest of translating the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of his law, I mean, to become his own kingdom. So God wants the believers to be utilized to transfer his kingdom, his purposes, his ideologies and his culture to be completely marketed and transmitted and imparted on the face of the earth. Let me say this, man, no man has seen God. I will repeat that again. No man has been able to see God because God is a spirit. But believe me, men can see God. And the best way they can see God is through the quality of life and culture and the ideologies that believers are able to live. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, that these signs shall follow them that believe. So as long as we are called believers, they are signs designed to follow us. The purpose of signs is not for the believers. Signs were not designed for the believers. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, 1 Corinthians 14, that this sign that talks about the speaking of tongues, that it is a sign to the unbelievers. So the purpose of signs, the purpose of wonders, the purpose of miracles is not necessarily for the believers. The believers leave that as a normal phenomena. It follows them. But the purpose of signs is for the unbelievers. So though men may not have seen God, they can see God through the revealment of signs, the manifestation of signs, the quality of life that signs live. These are sons of God. Uh, what we consider as uh, the kingdom culture that we reveal on earth, that is how the men can be able to see God. The Bible talks about in the book of Acts, how uh, Paul and Silas have gone to a particular place. And the scripture records that they say, these are they that have turned the world upside down. These are they that have turned the world upside down. Muslims themselves have been taught over and over by Muhammad in their Quran that anytime you are stuck, Look for the people of the book, the people of the book. So they know very well that believers are the people who possess the final solution in case people are actually stuck. That's one of the reasons why, reason why we cannot classify Christianity as a religion. No, we cannot. We can talk about other religions, but Christianity is not a religion. It is a way of life. Okay, it is a way of life. We are actually kingdom citizens. We are positioned on earth to manifest a way of life that should be able to affect all the rest. We are called the salt of the earth. We are also known as the light of the world. So there's a quality of life that we live that should be able to make an impact on the face of the earth. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to make it very clear to us that as believers, therefore, one of the key emphasis we need to embrace is the kingdom. We need to preach it. We need to teach it. 
We need to emphasize it. We need to help believers to come into it. This is a doctrine that every human being needs to get to understand because if we can get this correct, then we will translate into a dimension we've never been. One of the greatest ministers who ever lived uh, is called Dr. Miles Monroe. Miles Monroe, towards the end of his ministry, he actually had an emphasis of the kingdom. He wrote books about it, taught a lot about this, and he emphasized more about the kingdom of God. And let me say this, this is one of the things that we need to constantly listen to over and over and over. Yes, you need a miracle, I do understand. Yes, you need a breakthrough, I do understand. But let me say more than anything, after your breakthrough, what next? After you get the car you have desired, what next? After you get married, what next? After you get the miracle, what next? There must be something higher than things. There must be something higher than the results we want. There must be something higher than what we are looking for. And what we are looking for is not the gift, but the giver of the gift. So that means in God, there is something else. You know, when, when, when the writer of Hebrews is writing in Hebrews chapter number six, uh, let me go to chapter five, first of all, Hebrews chapter number five from verse number 12. He says, while you ought to be teachers, it seems as though you need to be taught again, taught again, the elementaries. Now, this is Hebrews chapter number five. So he's rebuking them and telling them that while you ought to be teaching, it seems as though you need again to be taken back to the kindergarten and to be taught the fundamentals, the elementaries of Christianity. Then in chapter number six and verse number one, he tells us that, uh, uh, that unless there is an emphasis, we would rather instead go deeper in verse one. He says, unless there is a need of us to stay at the elementaries, we would rather instead go to the deeper things. And so he now begins to explain to us what the elementaries are. Now, those are the foundational doctrines. He talks about the doctrines of baptism. Please stay with me. The doctrines of our faith, the doctrines of our, uh, eschatology, uh, the doctrines of our, uh, what we call righteousness. He tries to, exp uh, of, of, of salvation, uh, of uh, works of righteousness. He tries to explain to us different doctrines that su are supposed to give the believer foundations. But he's, he, in verse one, he tells us that there's a need of going deeper. Now, the emphasis of salvation is not necessarily to go to heaven. If that was the case, you would have gotten born again, died, and gone to spend eternal bliss together with Jesus. But the core reason why God allowed you here on earth, actually, Jesus makes a prayer in John chapter number 17 for his own disciples and extends it for also those that will believe. He says, I pray not that you should take them from the world. Though the world hates them, in John 17, I pray not that you should take them away, but rather that you should preserve them in the world. And let me paraphrase, that they may be able to manifest you and me, O oh Father, on the face of the earth. So we have been assigned to manifest the kingdom and to project the kingdom of God. I really don't know how to emphasize it much more, but I want you to get this because God wants his culture, his ideologies, his way of life marketed on the face of the earth and he wants people to be transformed we need to translate this into the place of politics we need to bring it into family we need to bring it into the business uh, level we need to bring it into government we need to bring this into education all systems of the world can fail only the kingdom of god and the government of god and the systems of god have the ability to sustain humanity and take humanity to the next level every other system just the other day they were discussing about after we were we had faced of april 4 and we brought in the CBC uh, education system. They were actually arguing how it also has challenges. Listen, every system will fail. Uh, they were having a discussion some years ago about what we consider as a capital system, uh, the capital way of government. And you know, they were looking at it and one particular pa uh, person rose up, who was a prime minister of the United Kingdom and made a statement that was very profound. The person said she was a lady and made it very clear that the system, the capital system, can capitalistic system cannot be able to sustain Sustain the nations as it were, because it only favors a few and denies many. It will make the richer become richer and cause the poorer to become poorer. Only one system can survive, and that is a system of the kingdom of God. We need to emphasize this. This is what should penetrate families. This is what should penetrate penetrate the raising up of our children. I mean, more than the sermons we preach and motivate people, which are one of them that motivates people, we need to ground people and bring them into true kingdom ethics, lifestyle, culture, 
and ideologies. And I want you to stay with me because this is an emphasis we cannot outgrow. Now, I want to go deeper and I explained later last week that there are five ways in which the kingdom can advance. And I'm just repeating it over and over as an emphasis so that we can all get it. I said, number one, the kingdom can advance through what we consider as a preaching of the gospel. And I also emphasize beyond preaching, uh, the kingdom can also proceed through prayer. The kingdom can proceed or advance through ministry. The kingdom can advance through missions and evangelism. And then number five, I said the kingdom requires finances, which has been an emphasis, which I'm hammering over this week. Now, there's a core reason why I'm doing this, and I hope you'll not grow weary of me, because money is one of the integral parts of people's lives. This is what affects people. Even Jesus said, you cannot serve God, neither serve money. He was simply trying to say that one of the things that is a major competitor of the hearts of men as compared to God is money. So which means if human beings understand the aspect of how money operates and more so in the kingdom way, then we can be able to go far. So from Monday, I emphasize about the difference between kingdom financials and also Christian financials. I was able therefore to go deeper in the previous days to keep on teaching more about that. And yesterday I was able to also go ahead and talk about different givers. I emphasize towards the end about grace givers and these are now what we consider as kingdom financials. Now today I want to proceed because tomorrow I will be talking about two financial systems. Two financial systems. Now today I want now to go ahead and to speak about how you can be able to become a kingdom financial. How you can be able to become a kingdom financial. Please let me make it very clear that God has never limited any believer to towards tapping the ability of walking in wealth and being able to tap into kingdom financials so that you can be able to facilitate the purposes of God. Remember the ministry of Jesus advanced because he had women to support him. Remember the book of Zechariah chapter number one says my cities and my kingdoms will spread through prosperity. So God is looking for people that he can be able to anoint with this grace. And I trust that you're one of them. So very few points that I want to be able to hammer. And I trust that you will be blessed as you stay with me. So whatever you do, please invite somebody. Whatever you do, please drag in somebody. Take note of what I'm about to teach because it will help you. Remove the mindset of thinking that only a few can be raised up by God. You can be one of them. You are one of them that God wants to use. So how can I translate my life into becoming a kingdom financial? Number one. Number one, and this is very critical, is necessarily by understanding that we all have been called by God. Take note of this. We all have been called by God to become kingdom financials. We have all been called by God to become kingdom financials. Now, there is a statement that Jesus actually makes. He says, many are called, but a few are chosen. The statement that he actually picks about here is supposed to place an emphasis that is very essential. The calling there is the divine summoning. The chosen there is a willingness to respond to the summoning of the calling of God. So though God wills that many should come into that dimension, you must be willing to respond to that calling. Now, the response is what makes you the chosen of God. Paul in 2 2 Timothy chapter number 2 uh, from verses number 20, 20 going downwards talks about different types of vessels. Now let's just go there so that we can be able to understand. So number one is to understand that we have all been called to become kingdom financials. God doesn't have a few that he will use. We all have a summoning into that dimension. So go with me to 2 Timothy. Please again I say stay with me. This will help you. Second Timothy chapter number two and verses number 20. Okay. Second Timothy two and verse 20. Listen to what he says. He says, but in a great house, they are not only vessels of gold uh, and silver, but also of wood and earth, some of honor and some of dishonor. So he's explaining that there's a great house. So we are talking about the house of God. And within that house, there are people who are vessels of gold and vessels of silver. But believe me, within the house of God, there are also people who are vessels of wood and vessels of earth. Believe me that within the house of God, there are people who are vessels of honor and some who are vessels of dishonor. And that happens in all churches. Then look at verses number 21. He says, if therefore, listen carefully here, a man purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel of honor, <clears throat> sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared, listen carefully here, unto every good work. Watch what he says here. That if a man purge himself, he now translates himself from being a vessel of dishonor, which means all the people that are believers 
Though we are born of God and now we have been washed by the blood of Jesus, we are made the righteousness of God and we have received what we consider as imputed righteousness. One fact that we should not forget is that though we have that position, there are what we call levels of honor. Levels of honor is where a person is elevated in, in terms of how God will be able to use them. God doesn't use you necessarily because he called you. God uses you because you responded to the calling. Many are called, but only a few are chosen. So we have to understand that Paul now explains here that what now brings us into the chosen dimension is when we purge ourselves. The purging here is a response to the calling of God, the response of willingness to sacrifice to become what God is calling us to become. So he says here, if a man purge himself, then he now becomes a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Believe me, there are very many people God wants to anoint and utilize for him to be able to entrust with wealth and riches. Uh, but you must understand not everyone will be able to test what we call the true riches of the kingdom. There's what we call true riches. Not everyone will test it. There are few that God has appointed and ordained that he will be able to use. And you can be one of them. The only thing you do is to respond to his calling, to understand that God can use you. Do not just say, for example, that I'm called to be a preacher and mine is only just to become a recipient. My level is this level so I can only survive to become a recipient. If you want to be used of God, you can. God can make you a multi-billionaire if you are willing to respond. So number one is to understand that we are Called. Now, let me say this about those that are called and have responded to the calling. Those that are called and have responded to the calling understand that all that they have, listen carefully here, all that they have is of God. All that they have is of God. That means that they are aware that they are only but stewards of what God has given to them or what God has called them into. So look at Ecclesiastes chapter number five. Go with me quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Please, again, I emphasize, stay with me. This will be able to help you. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. I want to show you verse number 19. Look at this carefully. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. You can go read verse 18, but verse 19 is my, is my emphasis. Listen carefully to this. For every man also to whom God has given. Take note of that. God has given riches and wealth and has given him power thereof to eat. To, I mean, to his portion and to reach, I mean, to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Now, what I want to emphasize here is God has given. God has given. Now, a person that is called and has responded to the calling of being a kingdom financial, understand that God gives. So everything they have, they are only but stewards. God has given unto them. So go to chapter number six again, verse number one and verse number two. My emphasis is verses number two. In fact, let's just go straight to verse two. Let's just go straight to verse two. We are in Ecclesiastes. The Bible says, a man to whom, please again invite people. We need to work on this. A man to whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanted nothing for his soul of all that he desired. Yet God has not given him power to eat thereof. Now, that there's a difference between the man in chapter five and the man in chapter six. The man in chapter five is a man that God, a man that has responded to God and a man that is willing to be used by God. So they have the blessing of God. Now, that person we are looking at is a person that, quote unquote, is born again. But the man in chapter number six, is a person who does not know the Lord, but God has given to him. The only difference here is that though God has given to him, this person, because they do not know God, they don't have the blessing. The blessing is that power to eat, that power to enjoy. Okay, that's what the blessing is. So what happens is that others will enjoy it. That's one of the reasons why you have to understand that to the unbeliever, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number two, uh, I'm sorry about the noise at the background, just bear with me. To the unbeliever, God has given work. Go with me there. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number two. Now, remember, my emphasis is God has given. Please, again, stay with me. My emphasis is God has given. Now, go to chapter number two and verse number 26. Chapter number two and verse number 26. Look at this. The Bible says, for God giveth to man, I mean, to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge, and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. <laughs> Can you imagine? To the sinner, the unbeliever, 
all the people that you admire, Bill Gates, all of them, uh, you're talking of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the current rich man, I've forgotten his name, it's, it's, it's coming, but it's going, El, Elion, Elcon, or Elion, I've forgotten his name, uh, uh, and all these Zuckerberg, and all these major rich people, uh, all of them, one of the things that God has done is that he has given them the labor, they may enjoy, but one thing that God does is that gives them travail to labor for the one that he actually loves, the one that is good to him, and that's why we have, we will be talking later on about things like wealth transfer. So don't admire the sinner. Don't be looking at them and you're always praising them. Well, you can learn a lot as it relates to principles from them. And by the way, all of these principles, they exercise a majority of them are actually kingdom oriented apart from sacrifices that are wicked that they go out to pursue. But all that they have will later on be transferred back to those that God loves and those that are good to God. I'm not talking of just a good believer. I'm talking of a position believer. And that's the reason why I'm saying that those that understand that they are called to be kingdom financials, that all believers have been called to that. The first thing that they understand within that is that all they have is of God. They are only but stewards. Now, when you understand that all that you have is of God, then it means that you are under the command of God. You are willing to be used by God to transfer wealth. So God entrusts you with resources because you are willing to be used by him. Now, listen, go to Isaiah chapter, stay with me again, Isaiah chapter uh, number 10. Isaiah chapter 55. Go with me to Isaiah chapter number 55. And I want you to look at verses number 10. Please stay with me no matter what you do. Is this guy who has his border border was making noise at the background? God punish the devil. Amen. Now look at Isaiah chapter 55. And I want you to look at this in verses number 10. Isaiah 55 and verse 10. Then we will go to 2 Corinthians. So you understand that you are called. There is no few that God has selected. You too, as long as you're willing, God can use you. Isaiah 55 and verse 10. The Bible says, For as the rain raineth down and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it, it, look at this carefully, make it, it bring forth and bud, that it might give, underline this, if that's your Bible, Isaiah 55 and verse 10, that it might, it might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Take note of that, underline that, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse number 11 now shows us that it is compared to the word of God. So every time the word is made available, listen carefully here, verse 11 says, so shall my word. So the same way rain rains and the same way snow comes down is the same way God wants. God's word comes down. And the purpose of the rain and the snow is to cause the earth to bud. And so that when the earth produces, it produces seed to the seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So what the word does is that the word gives you seed and the word gives you bread. So every time you hear the word, it's supposed to give you seed and bread. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, again, stay with me, and verses number 10, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Paul speaking, he says, we though we being poor have made many rich. So one of the things about preachers is that preachers can give you even what they do not have. Every time we teach the word of God, we are able to empower you to receive a seed that can bring you into becoming wealthy, into becoming productive in life. Now, my emphasis Again, is seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Please stay with me. Stay with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, rather. And I want you to look at verse number 10 going downwards. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse 10 going downwards. Let's, let's begin with verse 8. Let's begin with verse 8. The Bible says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Somebody say grace. Type it somewhere. Say grace. <laughs> He's able to make all grace abound towards you. That you have in all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. So God is interested in you abounding in every good work. And then verse number nine, the Bible says, as it is written, he has dispersed, okay, abroad. And he has given to the poor and his righteousness remaineth forever. Now, notice the word that God has given to the poor. He has dispersed to who? The poor. The word poor are those that are needy. The ones that are hungry to be used of God. The ones that are desperate to say, Lord, I'm available. I want to respond to your calling. Make me a kingdom financial. The Bible says he has dispersed, not to the rich, to the poor. And the Bible says his righteousness, that means his divine order, remains forever. His structures are endurant. Look at verses number 10. He ministered seed to the sower. Now, that is what God has dispersed. He ministered seed to the sower, okay? Both uh, he that, let me repeat that again. He that ministered seed to the sower, but ministers bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. Now, again, notice what he has said. He has talked about seed 
to the sower and bread to the eater. And notice where it proceeded from. He giveth grace. Notice where it proceeded from. He dispersed it abroad. So God has made everything available. We only need to align ourselves to be used by God. And all the wealth that we need to have, God will begin to channel it to us. But that thing that God does is that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So that means there are two components. If you are an eater, the best you would receive is bread. If you are a sower, God will avail not just the seed. He will give you a combination of the bread and the seed. But God does not give the eater seed at the same time because they will still eat it up. The purpose of seed is to sow. The purpose of bread is to eat. Bread means your daily sustenance. So there are people who the only thing they are thinking of is what they will receive for daily living. So you are a consumer. Now, God doesn't relate with consumers. Now, God loves us enough to meet our need. And God can provide for our need. But God is not interested just in giving bread. God is interested in giving seed. Now, if you read the book of Genesis, you will discover in chapter number 46 of the book of Genesis, there is a statement that they say, the children of Egypt go to this man who is known as Joseph, and they cry to Joseph, Genesis 46. They tell him, give us seed that we may be able to live, we and our children. Give us seed that we may be able to live, we and our children. So you understand this, that seed is futuristic. Seed is for investment. Seed is for the purpose of going ahead to actually sustain generations. So if God will make you an investor, if God will utilize you to become a kingdom financial, then God will give seed to you, which means your thinking must outgrow bread. You shouldn't just be looking for rent. Shouldn't just be believing God to pay fees. Shouldn't just be waiting on God to have money to show off. Shouldn't just be having money to pay your rent or to have some food on your table or to be able to have a class in life. If that is your way of thinking, then God only permits you to have bread. But those that are called kingdom financials have responded to the calling of becoming kingdom financials. So they recognize all the habits of God. So if they recognize all the habits of God, then to them, they see it not just as bread. They see it also as seed. So they do not just see whatever they have as bread. If all you see is bread, then that means all that you will have will retain it there. So you will find out that there are believers who have fully budgeted their money and concluded that they cannot have money to give. And so they limit God from blessing them. Because listen to me, if your hand is bound like this and God wants to give to you, God cannot do so. It, the stingy person will never receive anything. But when you unlock and you allow your hand to be open, then you will notice God can use whatever you have. The scripture teaches us that when Jesus asked the disciples to feed the multitudes, he made a request. He told them that I want you to feed. And they all answered him. They said, Lord, even if we look for supermarkets, we couldn't handle this number of people. And there's not enough bread. And that is when one of them came and answered, Andrew, and he spoke and he said, but I found a child who has two fishes and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, bring it right here. I want to show you the principle of using whatever is there. He takes the two fishes and the five loaves of bread. The scripture says he lifted it up and gave thanks, opening it up his hands to the father. He gave thanks and immediately the power that breaks limitation landed on it. He gave thanks, blessed it and broke it. That means there's an anointing that land. God can use whatever you have and multiply it as long as you understand to respond on the calling. Look at yourself as an investor. Start from where you have. Don't begin to tie yourself. All I have is my fear. Believe me, even that fear, God can take it. If you know how to put it in his hand, thank him, bless it, and allow him to go ahead and maximize it. He can break a limit. A woman with a jar of oil and a pot of flour, put it in the hands of the prophet, and the anointing that removes the limits was landing on it. For over three and a half years, she endured more than enough. A woman that had a jar of oil brought it to the prophet, and when the prophet asked her whatever she had, when she answered the small jar of oil, the prophet spoke a word that removed the limit. From the jar of oil, the woman began an oil company. Start from where you are. Understand you are called. God can use you. God can use you. You have a seed in your hands. You have it in your hand. Pick it. And when you begin to allow God, knowing that this is God who put it, whatever you have, God gave you. 
Don't begin to say it's only the people who are this that God, God gave you what you have start from where you are. Whether you have a million, or whether you have 10,000, whether you have a thousand or a hundred or even 50, whatever you have in the level you're in, in whatever nation you're in, God positioned you for a purpose for you to become a kingdom financial. Number one principle is that we are learning here is that a kingdom financial, number one, understands that they are called to become kingdom financials. And that means they have responded because many are called, a few are chosen. The chosen are the ones that have responded. And the ones that have responded understand that everything they have God has given to them number two the second thing that makes you a kingdom financial is that you must understand that all you have please listen okay that the papa the all you have and let me change my statement here understand that the purpose of work is to make you a blessing okay the purpose of work the purpose why you must work whether you're doing business, whether you're actually uh, doing your own career, the purpose of work is to make you a blessing. Now, please remember, you do not work to pay bills. Neither do you do business to pay bills. If you do so, again, your mind is limited. And again, you go back to the bread eater. The purpose of work is to become a blessing, not to pay bills. Not to pay bills. Now, let me say this to each one of you. As a man think it's so easy. As, if you think of how you will only pay bills, if you think of only how you need money to pay rent, that's the best of what life will give to you. Thoughts are attracted by nature. Naturally, every way you position yourself mentally will determine everything that will gravitate around you and even how people will begin to bless you. There's a way that whenever you position yourself mentally, you will realize that certain reason. Did you ever notice that there's a language of rich people operate by? That's one of the reasons why if you stay around rich people, one of the worst mistakes you can do is to beg. The best you can do is to have a language like they have, to know how to position yourself in a discourse like they have. By the time you do so, it is easy to be entreated. Listen to me, there are people that have money that do not have ideas. So if you know you have ideas and they have money, you can easily trade with them because you will utilize the power of language and they will pay for your ideas. I have a son of mine right now who is together with a certain pastor. They're in the process of selling an idea that they have sold and are partnering right now with Safaricom. And people like Safaricom and others are willing to pay good money for it. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, don't ever despise what you have. So the purpose of work. So we are in Ephesians chapter number four in verse 28. Because of time, I will just quote the scriptures. Ephesians four in verse 28. The Bible says, let him that steals, steal no more, but let him labor with his hands that he may have enough to give to him that has need. The purpose of work is to be a blessing, not to pay bills. That's a second way that you begin to position yourself to become a kingdom financial. The purpose of work is to be a blessing. So if you are not working, go work. Utilize whatever you have as a skill in your life. Bring it into a posture or begin it to labor. The Bible says, he that with the whole that grain shall receive a curse, but he that selleth it shall be blessed. He that with the whole grain shall receive a curse, but whoever sells it shall be blessed. That's scripture, Proverbs. The Bible teaches that in the book of Proverbs. The, grace, the grain there, grain, is symbolic of your gift. Whoever sells, whoever trades what they have, whoever takes it out to work, shall be blessed. But if you withhold it and say, okay, one day I'm waiting for a miracle, it will land on my head. It doesn't work like that. Put your hands, your skills into work. I'm working right now. And believe me, it is natural as I do so, the blessing will follow me. And I'm not talking of your offerings. There is a way that God will cause me to operate in favor. And naturally, I will be a blessing. So the purpose of work is to make you a blessing. Understand that not to pay your bills. Change your way of thinking and you will notice you will begin to rise into becoming a kingdom financial. So that means to you, your salary, that means to you, your profit is all but to be a blessing. So that's one of the reasons, for example, I would explain to people that what you think of first when money lands in your hand actually explains who is God in your life. The first moment money lands in your hand like this, if the first thought you're having is to pay bills, uh, then you must understand if it's to pay your rent, your landlord is Lord. If it's to go ahead and pay school fees, then uh, that principle is Lord. But if money lands in your hand, the first thought you have, number one, is how you can honor God with your tithes. Ladies and gentlemen, you can go for, I have one of the people in PMI, one of the part
One of them. He was calling me the other day, giving me a testimony. And he was telling me, Pastor, I have a testimony I have to give you. He said, you can, you, I, I want to amaze you that my degree of giving and how I disband my money, as it is, I was sitting with my wife, he's telling me that, and I've discovered I usually give about 46% of all I am earning. Now, he is employed. He said, I give 46%, not 10%. So he pays his tithes. He partners with ministries, for example, like my own, and supports one or two other people a little bit here and there. And he was giving the testimony of pastor. We have never lacked, never run dry. We have even an abundance. <laughs> we, we, they had lost one of their child. I mean, the wife had miscarried. God just gave them a miracle right now. I mean, God is answering their prayer. One of the wealthiest men we have in Kenya is a born again guy, just with the whole his name for purpose. Uh, this guy, he says he gives God 80% of his money and lives on 20%. And he claims to be a billionaire. He had told God at every point God will elevate him. He will be increasing the percentage from 10 to 20 to 30. And listen, that's one of the things that the enemy will fight you. I remember one time I was also taking my percentages high. And as I was doing so, I saw what they are coming to me. That's when I discovered the enemy doesn't like this thing going in that order. I will repeat it again the purpose of work is to be a blessing not just to pay bills you can never have enough every time you will always notice i know that there's a level enough you have an abundance and you can live beyond what you have but believe me the purpose of everything you have is to be a distributor so i encourage you again the core reason why you work is to be a blessing number three and i close with this what can make you a kingdom financial is to understand that the king's work requires haste Understand that the kingdom of God requires it. In other words, have God's purposes as a priority. God's kingdom as a priority. Know that there is an agency, not an emergency. The kingdom has agency. So God wants his purposes to be motivated. The more churches we build, the more evangelism we do, the more uh, ministers we send out, the more missionaries we send out, the more we can be able to enjoy the blessing of God much more and the more the kingdom of God spreads. We have to have a sense of agency, not a sense of selfishness. The kingdom has to be something that is a priority in our hearts. Listen, you cannot be a kingdom financial if the kingdom is not, not a priority in you. The Bible says in John chapter 2 and verse 17, after Jesus, John 2, 17, after Jesus whipped people and chased them away from the temple, telling them that my father's house should be a house of prayer. The Bible says the disciples remembered the statements of David in the book of Psalm, that indeed the seal of the house of the Lord consumes in me. It burns in me. In other words, Jesus was passionate when it came to his house. We need believers who are zealous when it comes to God's house. In fact, tomorrow I will start on that. And I want to encourage you, you cannot be a kingdom financial if you do not see the kingdom as a sense of urgency. Muslims know how to put the things of Islam as a priority. When you're dealing with other religions, they put it as a priority. Only Christians relegate it. They even struggle with their tithe. They struggle to partner. They are always struggling. They always see that every time they are giving, they are losing. They Listen, we have to put God's kingdom, God's agenda, as a priority. And I'm not preaching necessarily to tell you uh, that it's because we preachers require money. No, no, no. It is God's purposes. Think like that. And I know there are preachers who have made many believers become confused. And so at the end of the day, they have set it in order to an extent where all they want is money for themselves. No, we are beyond that. We begin to think kingdom. We begin to think about the path. We are asking God, Lord, use us so we can build churches for you. Use us that we can go ahead and sponsor missionaries for you. Use us that we can empower people in different ways. We, we had one of our sons. And uh, I remember at one time he just left the ministry in a strange way. I was angry at him. But later on, he told me how he felt. He wanted to go and do missionary work in a particular other nation, and which he did. And uh, later, I just prayed and I told the leadership, I just feel we should just support him, irrespective of my own anger in terms of I didn't agree with what he did. Let's send him some support. Why? Because in so doing, God himself will back us up. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God is looking for people who see the kingdom with urgency. And I close here. May you be kingdom minded. And that by itself will bring you to be a kingdom financial. God will have no problem in trusting you with true riches. Father, I bless all that have been able to hear me. And I'm asking you to raise them up. Make them come into the dimension that they will be able to touch true riches. I've spoken. Let your word work for them. I have spoken. Let your word build them to become all that they need to be. I have spoken. Let your word make them max. Signs and wonders on the face of the earth that these are those that God can raise for himself. I've spoken your word. As it has proceeded, let it water them. As it has proceeded, let it give them seed. 
and let it give them bread. Lord, I pray that it will break limits off of their resources. They will never struggle again in their finances. They will know what it means that the blessing of God is able to make creatures. They will experience an abundance beyond their highest imagination. And Lord, I pray for them that they will embrace the wisdom of knowing that God positioned them with the resources that he has so that they can respond to kingdom agencies. Bless them and keep them for your name's sake in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Wow, praise God. Listen, I don't know how to overemphasize what I'm teaching, but I really want to encourage you to listen to this message over and over and over. Trust me, it will help you. So if you join us later, go and listen to the message earlier on. If you have not gotten the messages in the prior week and even earlier on this week, I would encourage you go to my Facebook account, Pastor Pankras Gira, listen to what I'm teaching over and over and over, and let's get the heartbeat of God in our current generation. God is summoning us to do better than what we are doing. Well, let me close it here. I want now to give you an opportunity to be a blessing through your offerings also. You can be able to give your offerings. There are details that will be posted right now. There's a teal number and also a phone book, uh, I mean a phone number that will be posted. Pastor Gideon can be able to help us or Pastor Margaret. Uh, the MPESA teal number, uh, that's buy goods and services is 581854 581854 uh, thank you John I didn't know you're here today thank you for being here the details are all posted if you're watching on Facebook the details are there there's a phone number 0722572 3 Whether you're out of the nation, because I know there are others from uh, different nations here, you can also be able to communicate. You can partner with us, give in your offerings, or even pay your tithes. Uh, that you can be able to do. And allow me to bless your offering right now in the precious name of Jesus. Father, I ask you to bless every seed giver. And I pray that God, you may cause whatever they have to multiply. Break the back of financial limitation. Uh, listen, God is asking me to tell somebody here, Challenge me, challenge me. Whatever you have, challenge God right now. I feel an anointing. I've never done this, but I feel God telling me to ask somebody to challenge him. And there's somebody, God is saying, challenge me and see what I will do with what you have. And in the name of Jesus, by the anointing I feel, may the limits on your resources be broken now as you respond in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. I am a preacher, but believe me, I give. Even after I finish ministering, I give. So to even those that are ministers, don't limit it. Be a giver. That's how God will raise you. I can't teach what I don't practice. I practice it. And I witness God helping me several times. So let's go ahead and do that. Send your offerings. Send your tithes. Send your partnership. And the Lord will bless you. The details are all available. I love you all. Please join us tomorrow. We are back here again at 1 p.m. Whatever you do, don't miss it. Don't miss it. It will bless you. And you will go so far. I'm just reminded on Saturday, we are going to be having some event as a ministry. I just felt uh, God reminding me to remind us we are actually in the process of building a project. Uh, probably tomorrow we will find a way to communicate with people. We are building a project which we want to invite people to also partner together with us uh, in this particular project. Uh, we are building our church in our new site and we are believing God for quite an amount of money, uh, roughly uh, about $60,000. $60,000 should be 6 million Kenyan shillings. It's good to speak in dollars. Amen. <laughs> $60,000. So we are believing God for that to finish our project, to buy more land and to do much more. Uh, please, you can partner with us and uh, we will give you more details as we progress. Those that are actually on broadcast, you receive the details, we will send it to you so that you can partner with us. We love you all. We trust you're blessed. The Lord keep you. The Lord favor you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you.